So take it away, Mike. Myra, thank you so much. And Plymouth Church, thank you for your invite to be with you this morning. Um, Peter Hegard is not yet on this, uh, this list of attendees, but if he, I'm sure he'll watch this. So I'm going to take advantage of, of, this, of this moment to tell you uh, how much I admire Peter and Anne and what they've done for the city of Minneapolis and St. Paul and, uh, and uh, what I've been able to learn from them. Uh, 23 years ago, Peter Hegard started Urban Investors, as Myra described it. It's had 430 30 graduates. They're all uh, rising stars in Twin City Banks. Uh, they plunge in 10 different sessions throughout a year uh, in the urban core uh, and the most challenged households and neighborhoods of the Twin Cities. They walk around the north side with Don Samuels. They hear from Sandra about the Northside Achievement Zone and all the work they're doing. They learn uh, through a poverty exercise to uh, manage their own household budgets. Uh, they uh, are introduced to the leaders uh, in, this, uh, in these cities on turning around challenged neighborhoods, one of whom is on this call, Pat Hoban. Pat, hello, great to see you on this, uh, on this webinar. Uh, and she'll comment, I'm sure, about the story you're about to hear uh, in Phillips, where, um, where we've applied these lessons uh, to great effect over the last uh, uh, nearly 20 years. But back to Peter for a moment. You see Peter's background. You know that he was a, a leading banker at Northwestern National Bank, at least on Nicollet, and at least until it burned in 1984. Mm -hmm. Some of you will remember that, tr that tragedy. Uh, and he was part of the team that had to pick that up. And then was the founder and managing principal of Lowry Hill, an investment subsidiary of Wells Fargo. But the thing that makes Peter and Ann, the he guard so great, and you can see it through their large committed family, um, is they exemplify the civic pride, the civic sensibility that makes Minneapolis a very special place. You know, it's, it's, it's generally attributed to a Scandinavian tradition but we really stand out around the country by the, our ability to create partnerships across the sectors. And our, many of our corporate leaders, like Jim Campbell and Phillips, Gordon Springer, uh, the former CEO of Alina, plunged into the hardest questions of how we turn around challenge neighborhoods. And that makes us stand out. Well, Peter Hegard is the thought leader of, of really urban turnarounds and has written three books about return on investment from uh, social and public investments, those investments that really allow people to lift their households up, create an increase in median income and in wealth, and, uh, uh, and, and how bankers can assist even in the most market challenged areas of the city. So that, that's Hegard. Um, he's not on to defend himself from all those great things. And you all know him from, from his church membership. Uh, a great man, but also a humble one. So he winces when I talk about him like this. Uh, but they are both special, and Anne's watercolors are unparalleled in, in, in my view. Anyway, uh, I asked Peter, because I've been teaching his course, one course on Phillips for uh, over a decade, if I could uh, help him move the program to Augsburg University, which, as you know, um, is very committed uh, in, on its own to the challenged neighborhood of Cedar Riverside and has made such an extraordinary difference on Riverside Avenue. Anybody who's, who travels Riverside knows what I'm talking about and Augsburg is uh, also legendary. <clears throat> so I'm gonna turn now to the Phillips story. And again, Pat, I, I hope that, that, that you will add um, and others of you who are involved will add uh, stuff as we go. Please interrupt me. Myra, try to interrupt me. Uh, don't let me talk too long. But I want to tell you some stories about what the city learned from, from the Phillips experiment. This is an ancient PowerPoint, but it is topical today. The, the moral of this story is that you can turn around challenged neighborhoods. There is a methodology. There is no reason to be afraid of it. There's no reason to despair. And the most challenged neighborhoods of the city can turn around, and this is proof. I know that's topical today after Floyd. 
and we'll, and I'll tell you a little bit about what we learned. Some of it, none of which I knew in 1997, when as a as the head of the Alina Foundation, I was challenged to get involved in the Phillips neighborhood to improve the health of the community. But one further uh, opening point is that a lot of the lessons learned here were applied citywide by Mayor Ryback, uh, Council President Barb Johnson, Council Member Lisa Goodman, who is the head of the Development Committee, and applied to the whole city over the course of the, uh, of the following decade. And the policy theme that they brought to it was to actually prioritize economic development by prioritizing areas of market failure. Attacking market failure was their core principle of economic development. I think that's unique. I don't think there was a city in the country. I still don't think there's a city in the country that's done it any better than the city of Minneapolis. And a lot of that has to do with their leadership. So they stopped investing tax increment financing dollars in downtown commercial properties, right? A long time ago. They turned around commercial quarters through a program called Great Streets and other uh, really smart commercial investments and great nonprofit partnerships. They guided affordable housing um, and became the metro leader in affordable housing production, and they atta attacked crime. We attack crime from every angle uh, because crime curbs development and development curbs crime. So back to the Phillips story, and I'm going to do some storytelling. I have a really thick PowerPoint in front of you. We don't have to spend all of our time on the PowerPoint, but it, it just substantiates my point, which is all of this is doable. We can turn around challenged neighborhoods, and we have very effectively, at, but it takes partnership. And that is where our local effort has waned. That's our issue. Our issue is we've lost our, our, our secret sauce. We have to restore these partnerships and they are coming back quickly. But you cannot solve, Minneapolis cannot solve its problems with its government alone, with its nonprofit sector alone, or even with its corporate sector as strong as it is alone. You gotta go across all three sectors and you have to have a strategy. And Pat Hoven will tell you more about that too. So none of the Phillips story is possible um, without going back to the beginning. So Aaron, if you could go back to the, I think one more. Yeah. Oh. And one more. Thank you. Aaron Cork or Aaron, yeah. Aaron Corker, my assistant, is one more. I'm sorry, the other one. The other one? Yeah. Okay. Here's where here's here's where we started. Back. Thank you. Uh, poverty status in Phillips. Again, this is dated, um, but that uh, the, the strengthening of that community remains. The percentage of the total population below the poverty level in the period we're about to just describe gets a lot better, Phillips compared to Minneapolis. And the percentage of foreign born people in Phillips grows dramatically between 1990 and 2008. And this is part of the story of the Phillips turnaround is Lake Street became a regional destination, especially for um, his, Hispanic populations. One more. So here's, here's the ethnic distribution story in Phillips. And that, that light blue line is the explosive growth in particularly Mexican populations, which, uh, which migrated into uh, Powderhorn and Phillips along Lake Street not only to raise children, but also to create businesses, which is exactly what we wanted to have happen. And uh, with leadership from a, a nonprofit called the Neighborhood Development uh, Corporation and uh, Project for Pride and Living, we were able to greatly expand the commercial space along Lake Street that were dedicated to immigrant businesses, starting with about 200,000, capped off by the global market, 200,000 square feet capped by the global market. Next slide. And this just proves to you the long lasting and enduring um, result from the investment in the Phillips neighborhood. And this is part of what Peter Hegard has taught bankers 
through urban investors, urban adventures, as it was once called, it's really good business to invest in the commercial corridors of Minneapolis, including Lake Street. In fact, Sunrise Bank, whose board I served on um, 30 years ago, uh, really made the, their uh, mission statement to serve the urban core and has, has done really well. Next. Um, Pat, Pat will tell you, we started uh, the Phillips partnership really uh, between the Alina Foundation and uh, Honeywell in the first instance. Honeywell was located three blocks uh, from Abbott Northwestern Hospital, big campus, huge player in the Phillips neighborhood. Uh, and I think Pat and Andre Lewis, her, her sidekick there, um, joined us at Alina in thinking that a lot of the investments that we were making in the community simply weren't working. The, um, the murder rate um, was 26 murders in the third precinct in 1995, earning the city uh, the term murderapolis in the New York Times. The median value of a house was $54,000 and the unemployment rate was 14.5%. Uh, and I think Pat's perspective, I know Andre also uh, at Honeywell was we, we, had to, we had to gather more institutional partners to create some kind of strategy for getting out of the, 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 the current jam. With the, the Phillips neighborhood uh, was home to 108 nonprofits, a lot of churches. I think there were at one point eight or nine Lutheran churches in Phillips. Um, so it wasn't without resources and substantial nonprofit energy, it lacked a strategy. So in 1997, next slide. In June of 1997, Mayor Sharon Sells Belton and County Commissioner Peter McLaughlin convened a meeting of Bonsignore, uh, Michael Bonsignore, the CEO of Honeywell and Gordon Springer of Alina, and basically set forth um, the facts um, and circumstances in Phillips, which was at, the, at, at that point tragic. And Bonsignore was looking down at a piece of paper throughout the briefing, and his participation was crucial, as Pat will, will, will tell you, throughout uh, the early stages of the Phillips Partnership. And this is what he was drawing on that piece of paper. This was the strategy of the Phillips Partnership. So he said, we're going to start with public safety. We're going to establish leadership in each of these realms, and we're going to try new things, and we're going to keep doing the things that are working, and we're going to watch our results, and we are going to keep doing things that work. So you'll see the results of that through these different, these four different realms of investments, public safety, jobs, housing, and infrastructure, with different leadership in each, and all those institutional partners recruited to the task ahead. Any questions so far? Okay, I'll keep going. Um, Myra was a, a nurse at Abbott Northwestern Hospital when, uh, in 19, from 1990 to 2015, so I'm gonna tell her a story. Um, you may remember Dr. Pritzker. Dr. Pritzker, heart surgeon or a cardiologist called me one day and said, what are you doing? And I said, well, I run the Alina Foundation. And he says, I know you do. What are you doing? And I said, well, we have uh, a real focus on school-based medicine. We have the first uh, medical clinic in an elementary school um, in, in Minneapolis. And he said, no, what are you doing? There were 26 murders in 1995. What is your response to that? That's a healthcare issue. And, uh, <clears throat> and I knew he was right. Of course, violence presents a healthcare issue and it's inconsistent with the healing mission of a hospital. So Abbott Northwestern and Children's Hospital had a duty to lead an effort to try to prevent the violence that we saw. Well, as, as it became more successful, we also realized 
that crime plays a very special role in the development cycle of a city and its neighborhoods. Crime curbs development. Development curbs crime. It's really that simple. And this PowerPoint walks through the actual data that supports that, that, that proposition. So go back one if you would, Aaron. Aaron Corcoran, my, my longtime research colleague has helped me through this. I would have no chance otherwise. So the, the Phelps story is not possible. We gotta go the other way. Um, without some of the heroes that led it, in, including Pat, uh, Peter McLaughlin, County Commissioner, Jim Campbell, the CEO of, uh, of Wells Fargo, Minnesota, Sharon Sells Belton, uh, the former mayor, Lewis Smith, who was counsel for the partnership, Gordon Springer, Alina, um, Steve Kramer, and Paul Williams of Project for Pride and Living that played a crucial role for us. Uh, really key partners, children's leadership, um, the president and others there. Um, and we're grateful and I got to see a lot of this. So I, I, and I got to learn it and then try to apply it citywide and some policy making. So um, I'm going to make one more point and then I'm warning everybody you got to get in on this discussion, okay? Um, after the Floyd related unrest this year with the uneven governmental response, uh, there's been a lot of despair about the ability to build back Lake Street. I'm not concerned about it. We, this Phillips story that's in your PowerPoint is the story of $2 billion of investment over 10, 10 years, 2 billion, 1 billion in public investments led by public leaders like Belton and McLaughlin and $1 billion in private investment led by Wells Fargo, Children's, Abbott Northwestern and Alina, all considerably investing in their campuses, right? In fact, this, as Peter, Peter would tell you, as the former head of the Empowerment Zone in Minneapolis, this is the leading area of employment growth in the whole city for the last 10 years. And Phillips was on its knees when uh, the Phillips Partnership started in 1997. So the Floyd related unrest by my estimates, it's not an official estimate, but it's by mine based on the data that I've seen is about a hundred million dollars, maybe 200 million tops, but insurance is covering a lot of that damage. So compare those two numbers, let's say a hundred million in Floyd related unrest, $2 billion in 10 years. So the mountain that was climbed in the Phillips neighborhood over the last 10 years, is far higher than the hill that we face now. We can do this. That would be my message to people. We can, we can bring all the vitality back to Lake Street. It can come back with, with, uh, with, with, greater, uh, with greater gusto. So I just wanted to make that point. Um, Jackie, thank you. How specifically did Phillips address the public safety issue? Let's go to that. Aaron, if you could pull that up. I'm going to wait to stop. Yep. So um, we, we got to go into the safety sector of the PowerPoint. Yeah, keep going. All of this is, is, is a statistical demonstration of actually how the development in the area serves to move crime. It really does. When there's new investment, and it's, it's not, it's, it's archaic, but what it shows is the new campuses push crime out. But the, the question of how specifically did Phillips address the safety issue is a slide in this presentation. So keep going, Aaron, to the crime section. And I'll show you. We're in the crime map. Keep now. going, keep going. Are we behind? Keep going, keep going. There we go. Okay. So the, 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 the most effective intervention I saw um, was the partnership between probation officers and police officers. So police work can be leveraged by Hennepin County in ways that is quite topical. In fact, Hennepin County is an ideal partner for the police officers and we learned it in 1998. 
So through the work of Phillips residents, led by Phillips residents, ingenious work led by people like Jana Mechi and Carol Pass and others in the, in the, in the Phillips neighborhood, Muriel Simmons. Um, and they, they, they set up key strategies that changed the way the police department worked in Phillips. One of those was this partnership with probation officers. One of the most fearsome presence in Phillips during this period of time was the probation jacket and not just the police badge. That's because probation officers have the ability to revoke probation and throw you right back in jail if you're, if you're offending the terms of your release. Uh, the terms of your probation uh, will not allow you, for example, to, to, to use drugs or alcohol. So if there was a reason uh, to, a, after a door knock by a probation officer to think that you were using, you could be sent back immediately back to jail, which for the, for the, what we called the frequent flyers in Phillips was a key intervention because a lot of the crime was coming from people with long rap sheets, long historic involvement in crime, in crime and, drug, and drugs, and uh, and and their residence in the in the in the community of Phillips uh, was causing great harm to the neighbors, and the neighbors stood up to that. So that was one way that that uh, that police probation partnership again, mostly uh, designed by the residents of Phillips, who had a very close relationship with the third precinct. Again, I'm told that that has all changed but the residents really saw the third precinct as on their side. Uh, also, there were crime, uh, community safety centers developed. You may recall at Chicago Lake, there still is the Midtown uh, um, Community Center, Community Safety Center, and that was operated by Hennepin County and uh, the city of Minneapolis and, and, and the police department. And I handled the real estate deal to open that safety center as the head of CPED in, in Minneapolis. And we opened it at one of the most crime challenged intersections in the whole city. And we did it and we opened the wind. The windows are wide open, large and open um, to, to discourage the level of crime in that intersection and it had a great statistical impact. We also uh, believed um, and Chief, former Chief T Tim Dolan in Minneapolis believes that youth jobs is a key intervention. If you looked at, at, um, at, at the crime picture in 1998, it was much more youth, youthful um, in Phillips and Northside than it is today. That is, we had a real youth crime problem. And Dolan himself, um, uh, it tells me that he had, his, he had his first juvenile delinquency in seventh grade. And he got, he, 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 one, of, one of the things he got was a job at the park board. And he went to work cleaning up the area lakes uh, and parks. And he believed that really had made a difference in his life story. So you'll remember Mayor Ryback um, started uh, the Step Up Jobs Program with uh, US Bank CEO R Richard Davis. And today, looking back at, at the history of Step Up, it's now in its maybe 15th year, it has placed 30,000 Minneapolis youth and jobs. So those are th three things that I think have really changed the arc of, of violent crime in Phillips. But there's much more to that story. The, the neighbors um, um, uh, started a, 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 crime, a, a crime watch in, uh, on Bloomington Avenue, where they went out in the middle of the night and tracked the license numbers of people from other neighborhoods who were driving through, and they sent letters home to these to these uh, to these licensed households and said, um, "Someone from your family is driving down Bloomington at 4 a.m. Just so you know." So those are those are those are some of the stories, and Pat can help flesh that out more. Tom Anderson asks, "These programs sound wonderful. I'm interested in how you get community buy-in to this work." Isn't there always the risk of doing work to a community that, rather than with a community? Of course, Tom, great question. Um, the local um, <clears throat> governance for the community blew up. People of Phillips was the, the, the local um, nonprofit that really ran um, 
and, and governed the Phillips community, and it went it went bankrupt actually when we at the time we started um, the Phillips partnership. So we went door to door, and there was no lack of of engagement with the residents. They were our heroes. Uh, they had really stuck stuck out Phillips, and all of our strategies, especially housing strategies, were designed to strengthen their hand as homeowners, to really lift up their property values. In fact, we turned around Phillips with basically no gentrification. I think, and I think we can prove that in this PowerPoint. Um, so it was a powerful effort. Joe Salvaggio guided some of our housing programs and Joe was intent on doing it to strengthen the hands of, of, of people who lived in the neighborhood. So we, we provided them with exterior improvement grants for their house. We, uh, we, we helped uh, design better park spaces. And then we also in integrated all of our job training programs into the, for, for the neighborhood. So we actually uh, raised up incomes as we were raising up the value of the homes. Um, there's another point here, if I can slide that, uh, about the third precinct. Um, what in your opinion caused the third precinct community to lose its trust in the third precinct uh, police department? Well, um, I, I really don't know. I haven't been that close uh, to, to, to that. I think I, I've asked the police officers who served there, and I think um, part of it was the the residents and the and the third precinct were united in a campaign to remove drug dealers from the neighborhood. It was easy to identify the drug dealers. At least it became easier to identify them. And they were enemies of children and people who lived in the neighborhood. And so there, there was constant interface, constant contact and, and trust developing. It wasn't perfect for sure. There was a lot of criticism uh, from from really smart people like Jana Mechie, who lives near 29th and Bloomington, about certain law enforcement approaches. So it was common for there to be uh, criticism going back and forth and to manage it. We actually managed that conflict. So at times when the citizens were upset um, with with the with the police department, we'd sit down and work through the the, the data and then and then try to make adjustments. It really helped a lot that Pat Hoven um, and General Mills organized Minnesota Heels, and she'll tell you more about that. It's in the PowerPoint too. So these were uh, quarterly meetings. Do you know how many law enforcement jurisdictions there are that police the Phillips neighborhood? What would you guess? Go ahead, put it in chat. One, five, no, 18 law enforcement jurisdictions police um, Phillips. So uh, Pat had the novel idea with, with General Mills of getting them all together quarterly and say, well, what are we doing about this? And the, the residents were able to attend that too. So that really helped them see transparently what the law enforcement strategies were. John Humphrey asks about, uh, is Phillips um, addressing uh, particularly the issues of violence for Native uh, women. And I, I'm, not, I'm not prepared to answer that. John, I'm out of touch uh, with uh, Little Earth. Um, I've, I've heard great things about what they're up to, but I, I really can't comment in any detail. Robert Lilligren would be able to answer that question. He's very active um, uh, on, uh, 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 with the Native community. Let's see. Okay, so we're going to go back to uh, our, our law enforcement tactics. Um, one of the things that was adopted in downtown Minneapolis is the safe zone. So the origin of the safe zone is Phillips. Because in Phillips, we set up, you know, we had no basically very little internet at that point, but we set up an intranet site that united private security at Abbott Northwestern and elsewhere with the, with the Minneapolis Police Department so they could respond to events together. 
so they could chase fugitives together through through um, through Phillips, and that has translated to the safe zone downtown, which does it all in a very modern way in the first precinct. It also led to a partnership with Target um, that um, that was that really helped the city use technology well for the purposes of apprehending fugitives uh, and other criminals. And then we also did a lot of training, both uh, training of, of police officers and working with neighborhoods uh, and residents and vice versa. So there was a lot of there was a lot of linkages and a lot of face time spent between residents who who really led the strategic effort and the police who were trying to perfect emergency responses in Phillips. Next. Watching chat too, we're trying to watch chat to make sure we're responding to your questions. They're very good. Um, <clears throat> these were all specific initiatives that we did uh, with residents. We, uh, we were out there uh, a lot of Saturdays helping pick up trash. I think that really helped. I don't live in Phillips, I, I live in St. Paul, but but I was out there with my children picking up trash. I uh, was very close to Muriel Simmons who died about eight years ago, a uh, close friend of mine. So we'd spend a lot of time at, at, at her house and working around the neighborhood. She lived at uh, 28th and Portland. Um, so we did things together. And as I said, we pledged as, as a health system to take on housing. Uh, this is a great story. You you might remember that Honeywell um, cleared off two square blocks to the east of its headquarters, thanks to the again the leadership of Pat Hoban and Andre Lewis and Michael Bonsignore. They actually took out two square blocks of housing. We figured that about 17% of the serious crime in the third precinct was coming from these two blocks. They were problem blocks. And as you may recall, a Honeywell employee was shot and killed in the parking ramp next to that, that neighborhood, I think in 1996. And Bonsignore had made, had made it clear that Honeywell wouldn't stand for any more violence. Um, and if something like that happened to another employee, they, they would be looking at another corporate location, which would have been the beginning to the end. At the very same time, back to you, Myra, if I could, Aaron's making some adjustments. Um, it Gordon Springer, the CEO of Alina, took a meeting with the cardiologists at Abbott Northwestern in about 1997. And um, they said that they were seriously considering a proposal to move a lot of their practices to the suburbs and West Health, particularly out on 55. And Gordon, who was a longtime president of Abbott Northwestern, loves the place, um, was uncomfortable with that because losing cardiology as, as a basically a profitable line of medicine is the beginning of the end for, for, for a major hospital site like Abbott Northwestern. And there was a lot of capital investment in the Abbott. So he asked him, what, are, what, what do you need me to do to keep you all here? And they said, we need a new heart hospital and we need crime to stop. We need murder to stop. So uh, Gordon took on building the new heart hospital and it's up these days and looking really good on that campus. And the rest of us in, in Honeywell and General Mills mightily took on uh, with us the violence prevention issues. And through all this, all this strong work across four different parts of the strategic plan who made a difference. So that's my story, Myra. Do you remember, remember some of that? Jobs, everybody asks, are jobs linked to violence prevention? Oh, of course for youth, there is no question for youth. The, the adults, I think so, um, but it's, it's really potent for the youth population as, as Dolan, uh, uh, will tell you, Chief Dolan uh, taught me this. But the largest hospital-based job program in the nation was at Abbott Northwestern and Children's. 
Train to Work uh, was an entry level jobs program run by Project for Pride and Living. And then we actually opened a college space between Children's and Abbott Northwestern and graduated people up the, up the healthcare ladder. So we were the first to really use the health ladder for all the way from entry level to nursing and physician levels. We were moving people up. They were taking college classes right after work, uh, right there in Phillips, thanks to Minneapolis College. And you see some of the numbers that came out of that, big numbers of, of graduates and placements in, in, that, in those hospital-based programs. I won't go through all those stats. They're, they're more detailed than, than we need to today. And the Health Careers Partnership made that difference for, uh, well, what became over 2,000 students enrolled. Because everybody asked us, well, someone can get a job as a janitor at Abbott Northwestern Hospital, but it really doesn't move them up to the level that, of, of income that Myra and other, other nursing and physician colleagues made at, at Abbott Northwestern. And that was true. So we started the college and it worked. Minneapolis College has a strong nursing program. There you see some of the investment totals. Abbott, next. Wells, Wells is a lot more than that. This is dated. It's over 500 million now. Alina moved into uh, Midtown Exchange in 2005, making that, that possible. Children's uh, has a beautiful campus uh, that goes right across Chicago Avenue. And all, all of this stuff was, was, uh, was, was fairly controversial. There were tight council votes on a lot of this. Not all the local council members that I served uh, in, in Phillips voted for this. Tom's question. Tom asked, the neighborhood right around Plymouth has seen, seen more, more trouble in the last couple of years. How can Plymouth be a part of the solution to this increasing problem? Why don't you get Pat Hoven on it? Um, she was on it the first time in 97 and uh, and and it, it was impressive. Um, of course, everyone's dealing with more crime. I now work also at the Hennepin County Attorney's Office where I work with uh, the county attorney on issues uh, related to violent crime. Um, and I, so I, I've seen all the trend data. It's up on uh, guns. Um, uh, gun violence is up and homicides are up. Uh, about 26% year to date, countywide. We might be nearing a, 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 we might be rejoining the record level of, of, of homicide we saw in 1995, which was 97. We're gonna get close to that in Minneapolis. Countywide numbers, not quite as bad. Suburbs, not nearly as bad. Um, so the, but the MPD um, has a wonderful database. Don Samuels has learned to use it. Um, so you might want to get in touch, Tom, with Don, uh, because he's using it on the north side. The north side has seen 5,600 shot spotter reports this year. A shot spotter report is an automatic report when a gun goes off into MPD. There have been 5,600 gunfire discharges on the north side, and Don is tracking them on Facebook very effectively. So his his leadership has been key and I think Plymouth can do the same. I know you're experiencing a, a little more chaos because of the decline of, of the commercial quarters during the pandemic. It's just taking too much good traffic away from uh, from from people who who shouldn't be out in the public square. And uh, and that's that's a regional problem. I think some of that will abate with the pandemic. But um, but I would I would recommend reaching out to Don and and getting his advice too on how he uses data. <clears throat> so the impact of of these interventions, we just have five minutes. Yeah. Okay. Aaron's keep trying to keep me on track, but this the story is so rich and so really under underreported that, um, and was so exciting to be a part of that um, I get to talking too much.
but we'll, we'll, we'll stay on your questions and make sure we, we answer those first as they come up in chat. I'm not just saying this. I'm, I'm saying the partnership efforts I've described and I got to see and be a part of in some, to some degree has made huge and lasting change to the economy in Phillips. Again, everybody talks about Manhattan, like Manhattan's the only city in the country that has just uh, turned itself around. But in fact, this is a story about turning a neighborhood around basically without gentrification, which is not what happened in Manhattan. And so this was sensitively guided by people like Salvaggio, Steve Kramer, Paul Williams at PPL, uh, and Pat and the rest of us who were involved in, 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 the, in the Phillips partnership. And you see the employment numbers again, Phillips was the sky high leader in employment growth between 2004 and 2008. It wasn't even close. This was the employment growth area of the whole city. So we went from murder Apples to Minneapolis. Uh, and this is some of the development impact we had. And I can tell you more about these projects. But again, this is about uh, the footprint of a $2 billion turnaround. In, in the Phillips neighborhood. Housing, here, here are some of the programs um, that was, were guided by the community. The Phillips Housing Stabilization Initiative was guided by the citizens. We would flip roles. I felt like I was a servant and that it was their job to guide these investments, but like an architect working on a building, um, they wanted my professional advice on what was best and they made the strategic decision. She, they really acted as the corporate board. A lot of those citizen leaders I've, I've discussed. So we would put them in charge of these housing initiatives and report to them and ask for their guidance. And that worked really well. The Salvaggio Initiative was driven by a, a, a board of residents. They made the decisions on how they were gonna spend the money that we raised. And we went door to door Pat, you'll remember this meeting uh, when we started Salvaggio in 1998, and we said we'd be willing to raise money for a housing initiatives, initiative, and I went door to door and handed out 54 flyers to homeowners in the West Phillips neighborhood. Do you know how many people came to the meeting? 54. They all mm. came. Mm. And so when I said I'd be willing to raise money if they would join us in picking up trash and witness crime, uh, they agreed, and they they held up their side of the bargain more than held up because they went down to the courthouse and witnessed crime, which is the hardest thing to ask someone to do. Very dangerous, life threatening. I wasn't I wasn't taking that risk as a non resident, but they did, and they went down and started turning in these drug dealers, and that Muriel Simmons and Jana Mechie would testify, and then uh, other housing programs were similarly run by the community. Back to your question. Um, Tom, your earlier question, community buy-in. Well, they were they were kind of in charge. And it's already ten forty-five. We're done. Yeah. So, um, and you did talk some about how the pandemic, I think, affected the urban investors. So that's another challenge, I guess. Yeah, we, we, we actually will be focusing on Augsburg students next year. The banks want us to go younger in our approach to training. Um, so I think, yeah. I think Pat has a few comments. I, Pat, I hope you get on and, and add yours because I bet I forgot some things. Impact of the waterworks, of the new waterworks on Phillips. Okay. And I also um, am supposed to not talk about next week. And by the way, um, Thank you very much, not just by the way, but thank you very much, Mike, for that presentation. Well, we it's learned a lot. To be with you and to represent Peter and to some degree, Pat. Yeah, wonderful. It's good to hear about all this good work. And um, now you are supposed to imagine that you are receiving a warm round of applause from our audience because um, they're not there in person, obviously. And also next week, we of course have another forum, October 31st, Halloween. 
Um, that presentation will be on philanthropy and yearly giving. Um, and there will be two Plymouth Church members who are involved in that. Jean Thompson and Ryan French will be presenting that forum next week at 10 a.m. So it's 10.48, and I guess we're about out of time, maybe a minute or so left. But um, thanks again for everybody coming and for uh, your presentation, Mike. Uh, Myra, thank you. And just a note about Plymouth, you all get this. I know you get all this because you are the ones who got churches into housing in the biggest way possible. And Beacons remains a true example of what one church can do to, to really make a difference in housing. <laughs>